What a bullet! Scott Arfield! He's been threatening that recently! And all the Burnley players run to the Darwin end! Burnley win the next ball. It's Rory now. It's on the outside. He's on the Quickly finds Benson in space at the byline. Can Burnley get a goal here? Back for Brownell. Saved by the keeper. Yeah! Burnley won it to the end. That is magnificent. They deserve that. Only by Paul Fatella. Off for a hat trick. He's got it. Hat trick for Nathan Teller. Oh, he's on fire at the minute. 3 0 Burnley. It's Nathan Teller's day. And Burnley are three. And he's on the outside, comes inside, comes up a shot. Oh, what a goal! Manuel Benson once more. That is top class. Burnley have done it. Fantastic. Clarence deserves the championship title. They've been the best side throughout the campaign. Burnley have won the second tier. What a fantastic achievement. The players have been magnificent. Yes, hello everybody, welcome along to the latest episode of the Turfcast podcast pre-game show with me, Joram, and head of the big one this week. It's obviously the East Lancashire Derby and I am somewhat delighted to say um, that of course we have a fan of the opposition. Even when it's against them, we have to do it. I was going to go full Steve Waggett and just completely refuse to invite somebody on it, but no, we have Mark from the Blackburn End. How are you doing, mate? I'm okay. I mean, thanks for that intro that I was listening to. Is that just for my benefit, or do you just compile <laughs> well, everything? That, 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 that's it. That's every week, mate. That, well, every week, every oh, okay. podcast. It, it does. It just. It does need changing a bit. There's a lot of plays in there that are, are no longer with us. Um, so it does need mm. changing a bit. But I did want to wait. I just. I did want to get this podcast out of the way first. I'm not going to lie. Before I changed it, no, I might yeah. not change it because you, you can't change it all through the season. Um, but no. the Scott Arfield one, I've started with that for a long time. That was like yeah. one of the best goals in the derby, other than you know the Micah Hyde one in like 2005, which meant nothing so irrelevant. Mm. Um, so yeah, um, obviously, like I said, a big one then this weekend. Um, I have noticed yeah. a few of your fans. I mean, I'm not seeing anything from yourself. Uh, so when I do say these things, I'm not referring to anything that you put up, <laughs> but I have seen a few of your fans getting giddy. I've seen the usual mind the gap stuff after three games, which I don't know how you boys feel about it. It's just incredibly tedious. And it's the same Blackburn fans every single time. Don't get me wrong. It's the same Burnley fans putting it back up when we inevitably go back above you. Um, so yeah, you're getting giddy, aren't you? Aren't, aren't you? Some of your fans, how are you personally feeling about it though? Um, I hope that they are being tongue in cheek. And I certainly haven't put anything out there. Um, I think, if we're being perfectly honest, what's going on at Burnley at the minute? I think the transfer window finishing on Friday is the day before the game. You're not going to be able to register any new players. I think if we were going to ever have a chance in the last few years, it would be early on in a season when you change manager and there's a massive changeover of players. That is about as far as it goes for me. I think, you know, you're still massive favourites in my eyes, not just because you're at home. Let's be honest, you've been in the Premier League far more often than us recently. You've spent an awful lot more money than us. All these kind of things. Your depth and your quality should be better than ours. Um, but it's a derby, so you never know. But yeah. as for getting giddy, um, I'd take a draw right now. Yeah. You know what? I, I, I do think we have the better side. And we'll get into predictions at the end of the show. Yeah. I do yeah, think yeah. we are the better side, but despite everybody that we've lost. And I do think we have the better quality. Having said that, again, I'll get into some of your new lads. I've not seen enough of them. I do want to yeah, talk yeah. to you about them. Um, but again, just just to avoid it because of everything that's gone on this week, I don't know. I think I might take a draw as well. It's it's the first time. Like actually, just actually, just to take a step back. Obviously, those of you that have been watching the podcast for a while will remember that I did a pre-game show twice. Obviously, the one before the three 0 at home, and obviously the one nil at Ewood with Dan. Is it Ashworth his last name? Ainsworth. Who... Yeah. In, sorry, yeah, Dan Ainsworth. And I did say to everybody, Dan will be the only Blackburn fan I ever allow on this channel because he came <laughs> on. I, I had to invite him on because of the, the Blackburn fan and obviously the pre-game show. 
And he ended up being dead sound and I ended up texting him after saying, oh, I appreciate that, mate. You're a really good lad. And, you know, I didn't know how it was going to go because, you know, you get some you know, shit banter and stuff between the two. And I thought, oh, yes. I enjoyed it. I won't ever let anyone else on. But you have come fully recommended from Dan. Obviously, you used to do stuff wow. with Dan. Right? I think you and Dan did the podcast together. Then Dan's taken a step back now. Is that it? Yeah, I, w- I would say I'm. Uh, I feel honoured. But you know, as far as it goes, um, yeah. To be fair to Dan, Dan set up Rovers chat. I think it was seven years ago. Um, and you'll know how much effort goes into these things. Um, it, it's it's a various guys, and then I did a little bit with him over lockdown and stuff like that. And there was not much else to mm-hmm. do. And he turned around and just said last year, would me and uh, another fellow called Mike, Mike Beatty, do a podcast with him? They tried it before and he wanted to just get it going. We were like, yeah, we can, we've can. we both got busy life, but we can commit to that once a week. Yeah. As the season went on, um, you know, various things happen in life. You know, Dan's still a young lad and, and it, the commitment just got a lot, I think. So he stepped back, but he asked, would we continue it? Trying to take over Rovers chat, though, the logistics was a nightmare. So... It also felt a little bit like we were pinching his baby, so taking all the passwords mm. and all that kind of stuff. So we've set up as the Black Venom, but it's um, it is basically Rover Chat reborn. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, good luck with it, mate. It, you are right. It does. It no. does, it does take a lot of effort, a lot of hard work that I think some people don't realise. Even even just keeping yeah. up to date with the transfers, and obviously I don't oh, know yeah. how, how busy you've been, but the outgoings <laughs> and stuff this week, and like I'm driving somewhere and I get a notification on my watch. It's like we've sold Dara Roche. For God's sake, I need to put a tweet out. Um, so even stuff as simple as that can be can be hard work. So yeah, good luck with it, yeah. mate. Um, there's some mm-hmm. Blackman pages that do my head in, so fingers crossed you're not one of them when you start building a big audience. But yeah. <laughs> uh, well, let's get into it then, mate. Obviously, season so far, as I've said, your fans are getting giddy. You are currently above us in the league. Wins against Derby at home and Oxford at home. The way I see yeah. it, a decent draw at Norwich, but on I, I don't know how to judge Norwich at the minute. Obviously, losing Jonathan no. Moore, I don't think he played in that game as well. No, so I don't know how to judge them at the minute. You've you beat two teams at home. You probably would expect to beat. Where do you see yourselves now as a club? There was a lot of chat of losing Sammy that you'd end up, you know, going down. It's looking like you've got to be better than the likes of Derby and Oxford, and probably will not really be in too much danger. Although you did start well last year and then ended up fading. Do you think yeah. you've got stronger as a team or a little bit weaker from last season? I think it goes back further than that. So two years ago. JDT was there and at the end of that season we were we were on the cusp of the playoffs and we were probably at that point a 30 goal striker away from the playoffs yeah. and then India I don't know how much you guys know I'm not going to it loads but India basically put restrictions on the owners putting any money in they could pay yeah. the bills and that was it so instead of getting better that window we got worse we got worse in the January that continued worse last summer worse in January again so what that snowballed into was the end of last season really and John Eustace kept us up by, and all he came in to do was keep us up. Style of football was awful, but it was a job. So it went into the summer, and I think a lot of outsiders looked at it and went, well, Blackburn stayed up on the last day. They've now lost, or they're going to lose Smoddix. Mm. We'll say they're going to go down. Some Rovers fans look at it and say, well, we were nearly on the cusp of the playoffs. We were in a false position last season. I think it's somewhere in the middle. You know, you can't, you yeah. can't get worse for four transfer windows in a row and expect to be anywhere near the playoffs. To my mind... I didn't really know how we'd start. I had no excitement going into the season because I just didn't know what to expect. I think the five signings that we've brought in are probably upgrades on five that went out in the summer, but we're still very, very short. You know, we've probably got 13, 14 players that make a mid-table to, not not playoffs, but challenging for playoffs, I suppose. 13, 14 that could do that, but that's obviously nowhere near enough when you're playing Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Wednesday. So we are four or five players short that could play every week of of being anywhere near even remotely challenging for the playoffs. That said, I think, I think we'll be absolutely fine. I think we'll float around mid table. Yeah. I was going to start with my next question then. What, what are your Mm -hmm. aims for the season then? I mean, you said you've told me you'd expect to finish mid table, right? That's fair enough. What are the club's aims? Where do you think you guys want to finish like the board? Like where, where are they expecting you? Are they, are they expecting a playoff push or they're just happy with survival again? I mean, I think they like one and I think the players, you know, a lot of these players were pushing for the playoffs for two years in a row. So I think they want that. But realistically, we are four or five very, very good players away from that. I think what we, for me, it's not so much around league position because I just don't think we're going to get in the playoffs. So if you finish eighth or you finish 14th, it doesn't really matter. What I need to see is that we've improved and that there's a clear way almost next season that I can go, well, actually, with this and this and this coming in, I can see how we can challenge for playoffs. Uh, because coming into this season, 
I have no idea where we we're going to finish. Yeah, so I, I know you've already mentioned. A... Sorry, I, go on. Say, I, need to, I need to see a roadmap of a, a way we're progressing because we've not had that for two years now. Yeah, I know you've already mentioned the incomings, um, and I do obviously. Yeah. I did watch you against Derby because I think it was the the Friday night or the early kickoff Friday. on the day. I can't remember. Yeah, was it? Yeah, so I did yeah. watch that, and I do remember seeing uh, the Japanese lad with a good finish. Um, mm. And is, is it Gay with a good finish as well? Yeah. Um, so just to go through the signings that I've got on my screen now, apologies if this is wrong and I've missed one, but you brought in uh, right, right. Matt Gay, Yuki Okashi. Uh, I, I, if you know me, mate, my thick Burnley accent, I butcher every name, so <laughs> that's not, nothing different. Uh, Andreas Feynman, you know, an experienced championship player. The first two I've just mentioned are unknown quantities, um, but then you've got, you know, good championship experience in Feynman and Bath, and then you brought in Barrett from Everton. Um, is there anyone missing? Yeah. Uh, so we've got we brought Cal McFadden back in. Uh, Barrett Jack Barrett is a goalkeeper who's he's just gone in the twenty ones, and uh, yeah. Aidan Doxty again just gone in the twenty ones. So there, we we count as five that we've brought in really. And then there's yeah. um, used to uh, Mifumbe again, young lad from France, supposed to be very highly rated, but twenty ones for now. So there's the five so really. So talk to me about them. The, the, the three that stand out to me, obviously, Gaye, the Japanese lad, I'm not going to ruin his name again, and obviously Vyman as well. Like, how have they started? Like, like I said, I watched you against Derby. It's difficult to judge because you're playing a team that's probably going to finish bottom in Derby. Um, yeah. And obviously, I didn't see you against Norwich and I didn't see you against Oxford, so you will have obviously a bigger sample size. What are these new yeah. signings like? How have, they, how have they bedded into the team? So I think we, we were severely lacking any level of experience and that we found that in games. So when we were we were ahead, it just went. You could see the nerves, and the team didn't know how to hold out. And similarly, when we were behind under JDC, we didn't come back from behind hardly ever. So what we needed to do was bring some resilience in. So we brought in McFadden towards the end of last season. He's come back in, and, and he's not going to play every week. And he he will come on with ten minutes to go occasionally to shore it up. But he will play and just have some experience around the those games. You know, the odd game, and he'll have experience around the changing room. Danny Bath, I've been quite impressed actually when he's come in. I think he's a good, he's not going to start, but he's a good replacement if one of the other two get injured. And again, that experience, I saw him at uh, Stockport in the Cup. We had our 18-year-old right back making his debut and he just marshaled him all the way through the game. So I get yeah. why he's come in. Uh, and similarly, it, at Norwich, uh, not Norwich, uh, Derby, we were ahead. He came on, added uh, some height and added some experience to the back line and the game just died a death, which is something we've never had. Derby made it 4-2. Normally, Rovers, that would mean it's going to go 4 3 and you're going to be, you know, squeaky bum time. And the game just died a death, which was what yeah. we've been missing for a while. Vyman, similarly, really good experience. He's good on the ball. Mm. He's lost any pace that he had and things like that. Yeah. He just adds that bit of experience. It's just that now that you need now and again, whether that's coming off the bench. Um, good signing, I think. You know, he scored two goals already, one in the cup, one in the league. And you can just see that bit of quality around him. And then we've, we've brought in the two lads. So we brought Yuki Ohashi from Japan. He's halfway through the season there. He'd scored yeah. 11 goals in 22. So he's come mid-season, really. Uh, scored a great finish in, in the first game against Derby. Scored against Stockport, a good glancing header in the Cup. And then at Norwich, uh, beat Shane Duffy to a diving header. Great finish. So he's not, uh, he's not slight. He's caught quite well with the physicality of it. He's more of a... I hate these terms, but false nine. He sort of drops in and, and drifts in the pockets and things like that. But he, yeah. he seems a good footballer. I think he'll score 10, 15 goals this season, if I'm being honest. He'll probably struggle around November because he's played half a season already. But looks a decent sign, looks a decent footballer. And then the other one is Max Gaye, who's uh, six foot five. We've not had a striker who can hold a ball up for a long time. His elbows are everywhere. He will score one from the halfway line at some point this season, and then he'll he'll miss one from a yard out. It, it's going to be an exciting roller coaster with him, but he wins everything in the air. He is all arms, legs, the rear, the rear, you know. Against Burnley, it wouldn't surprise me if he got sent off, not through any malice, just because he, he puts himself about and his arms are up here. Yeah. And anybody who's a normal height, he smacks you in the face. Um, but he, he's he's decent to be fair. He's not just a unit. He can run in behind. I don't think he'll get as many goals as Ohashi, but he's um. He's an exciting player in that sense, really. He, he gets himself about there, shall we say. Yeah, so Ohashke and uh, Mike Targay, I think them two have yeah. come in to directly replace Smodic scores, haven't they? Do, do you think Do you think that they'll be yeah. able to do that? I mean, 
I don't think we're replacing 30 goals. I know it sounds daft because I don't think Sammy Smodix would have got 30 goals this season. I think he'd have got 15, 20. Um, so between Ohashi and Gaye, I, th I think they'll probably get 20, 25 goals. Yes. But we need to spread it around because I don't, don't know how much you know about last season, but Smodix got sort of 33 goals and that was like 60 mm. odd percent of our goals. So Dolan got three. Sam Gallagher, our other striker, got three. Sigurdsson got five early on and then barely any. So that's the big issue. We just don't get goals from anywhere else. So far this season, I think it's five out of our six forwards, uh, if you include sort of the three who play behind, have all scored. So yeah. Gaye hasn't yet scored in the league, though, which is something you need to address quite quickly, really. I see. Uh, I seem to remember him. Well, in my head, I seem to remember him scoring against Derby. He obviously didn't, um, but I no. thought I saw him. But he, he looked okay. I think in that game, I think it was oh, the it case does. of like yeah. holding the ball up well and stuff. I do remember being impressed with him. It does. I think my one question mark with him in the air, spot on, holds the ball up, can run him down. He's not. He's not short of pace. My one question mark with him is he's finishing with his feet. If I'm being honest, which is quite important. Yeah. Um, but he was <laughs> through on goal. He was knackered, but he was through on goal, and it was just a weak effort to the keeper. And I've watched, obviously, who knows what you're finding on YouTube. But when I've seen him on YouTube, he looks quite similar. In the air, pretty unstoppable. With his feet, work to do. Yeah, fair enough. To be fair, with the YouTube compilations, I know we all watch them when we sign players, oh. especially ones that we've unheard of. But you can make me look like a good player on one of them, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, let's talk about the the um, your manager situation. Because, again, mm. you, I know you said Eustace was coming to, to keep you up. And obviously, he did that. Um, whether he achieved that because Leicester were drunk on the last day of the season, I'm not sure. But obviously leading up to that, a very impressive win at Leeds, to be fair. And that the yeah. way you won at Leeds last season does worry me a little bit for this game. Completely shit yeah. them, just sat back and then counted them. And obviously Smodic got the goal. You've lost Smodic, admittedly. But what, yeah. are, what are your thoughts on Eustace compared to JDT? Because I think JDT was brought in as not a vanity project, but to take Blackburn to that next level and, and sort of like rebrand the football and stuff like that. Didn't work out, even though you had an OK for season under him, but for some reason the second season, it ended up all going to pot. Then John Eustace come in. I saw some people you know, not really happy with that. I thought that was a good appointment. I, when you sat JDT, I remember thinking to myself, they could end up going here, man, if they get this appointment wrong. I, I felt you got it right. He did well at Birmingham and was... Un, it didn't deserve to be sacked by Birmingham, so they brought in for an yeah. actual vanity project in Rooney, which did go wrong. But then, <laughs> obviously, after a little bit, I saw some Blackburn fans calling him John Useless and stuff like that. But eventually, like I said, it, it just seemed to click and it worked, and and you stayed up. What are your thoughts on on the manager situation and and your current manager situation? And what were your thoughts on JDT as well? Because I, I always like to get Blackburn fans' thoughts on him because it felt like it was something different yeah. that didn't work, and I think some fans understand that he probably is a good manager, but it just wasn't really a fit for Blackman. Yeah, so, I mean, Tony Mowbray had been there for, was it five years and steadied the ship? And you know what fans are like, they get bored of the same old. But Tony yeah. Mowbray, steady pair of hands, we'd never have gone down under Tony Mowbray. Whether we would have ever made it in the playoffs, I'm not sure, but, I mean, if you get a Tony Mowbray as a manager, you're a lucky club. Great man great person. JDT came in, we adopted a director of football model, we started to gamble on signings, which is probably what you need to do when you're not spending fortunes. Um, and the first season he brought in Smodic, he brought in Britain, these kind of players that were championship-ish players. And he played some great football, some of the best football I've seen as a Rovers fan. The problem mm. was, and the signs were there in that first season, was that he threw everything at the first 10 minutes. If we didn't go 1-0 up, 2-0 up in those first 10 minutes, and teams had sussed out, he would never change the way we played. I kind of put him in a similar bracket to company, in that I always feel those two, and from an outside looking in, you'll know better than me, but it looked like those two managers put themselves before the club and kind of were there to promote themselves and were there to say, look at what I could do with these group of players. If you give me a better group of players, I'll do even better, mm. rather than going, actually, this game needs something different. And what happened was the second season, when we lost a bit of quality, threw his, threw his toys out the pram uh, because he didn't get players in. Understandably so, we were the same as fans, but he just didn't adapt at all. We went away to Southampton and in 10 minutes, it was obvious it wasn't going to work and he just carried on plugging away and it was 4-0, it was embarrassing. Went to West Brom yeah. the week after, exactly the same. And it just continued and it was going only one way. It was too easy to beat us. It was becoming embarrassing from set pieces. So... It was going one way and it had to end. And he was coming out with statements about the owners, that, you know, and it ended. We got Eustace and I'll be honest, I was underwhelmed, but it was kind of, 
we need something to keep us up here because we are sliding. Yeah. And he came in with a, we will not lose. So my, I tried not to judge him towards the end of the season, my, my sort of, because he came in with a job to do. And my concern or worry, I suppose, going into the season was, are we going to be again? Let's not lose. And he was doing it at home. He was doing it with Sheffield Wednesday was a perfect example. If we'd have won that game with about three games to go, or even drawn it because of who we were playing, we were kind of assured of safety. And he went with this do not lose approach. And once they've gone one nil up, then you're really struggling. Uh, mm. That was my fear going into this season was kind of, is he going to adopt every game with a do not lose, which is not what you want to be watching. You know, you go into the championship and the good thing about the championship is you can usually see a way you can win wherever you're playing. But then the Leeds one, I know what you mean. It gave us hope. It kind of thought, hold on, there's a way here. He's come into this season and he he's shown that he can do almost every style within a game. So if we are ahead, he can we can sit back, but not in just a oh my god, let's you know all hands to the pump. We can sit back with a plan. We could come to you. I would imagine we will sit. I'm not saying we'll sit on the edge of our box, but we will understandably go. Do you know what? These are a better team. So what we will do is we will not go fully expansive. We'll we'll try and get them frustrated. The crowd are probably not the happiest right now. We'll try and quieten them or get them on their own backs. And then we'll go from there. And he can do that within the game. But then similarly, he played Derby at home and he'll fly at them. So actually, yeah. I've been really impressed with him. I have. Um, I, I didn't try and judge. I tried not to judge him, but you do. Uh, my concerns were that we'd be too defensive. And actually, as we are right now, I think he's just a manager who adapts to the situation and adapts to the game. So that's kind of what you want as fans. Yeah, it does seem like he has sort of like provided you with different sorts of game plans and stuff. Like, like I said, you, you did you did go at Derby. Um, I've not seen anything else, but mm. I did notice that you did go at Derby. And I, I remember thinking, yeah. yeah, maybe these are going to be better than the teams that are down there. Um, <clears throat> interesting, though, to hear that. Uh, obviously, I want to talk about um, sort of your thoughts on Burnley at the minute. You, you alluded to it there. The fans aren't the happiest at the minute. <clears throat> and I did mm. speak to, uh, it was Dan, actually, that I did speak to this week. And he messaged me and he said, how are you feeling about the derby this weekend? And I'm like, for the first time since about 2012 with this uh, derby, I'm actually a little bit anxious. And it's be and it's unnecessary anxiety. Like, if we'd have kept three of the players that we've let, we've let 16 players go. If we'd have kept just three of them, we'd have won this game, in my opinion, very easily. I still think when we bring Coley Orshaw back into the side, if he's not sold, Josh Cullen back into the side, if he's back from injury, and Worrell, obviously the new signing who wasn't registered in time, we suddenly become a lot better than what we were at Sunderland. The team at Sunderland was lacking, to say the least. Um, but then we've obviously ended up... I actually went on Sky Sports News and said that I think we will win the championship, provided we can keep hold of a lot of the players that we've kept hold of. Since then, I now look a mug because I've said that, and then we've sold pretty much everybody. So I'm not sure where we are as a team at the minute. It's a massive week at Burnley. There's going to be some incomings. Uh, hopefully ones that... You, for full transparency to those watching and listening, I am recording this on Monday, by the way, Monday morning, because I'm so busy with work this week, so we've had to do it very early. So if there are signings already announced that I haven't mentioned in this game, in this bit, that's why. Um, but as I said, I'm recording this on Monday morning. I believe there's three or four medicals booked for the next 48 hours. So fingers crossed we're getting these people over the line and we're getting them done. And the quality players, because I don't even know who they are, but no names at the minute. But what are, you, what are your thoughts as a fan of, you know, the main opposition for Burma, that like the team that, you know, we don't like and doesn't like us? Like, what are your thoughts on, on what's going on and, and how we've handled this transfer window? Because obviously we're all pretty getting frustrated now and pretty annoyed, but we've got a big week ahead and hopefully some quality players coming in. Yeah, I think from the outside looking in, I mean, the company thing, we didn't know how it would go. You know, he came in at the same time as JDT. We, did, we were kind of in similar boats at that point in terms of neither of us really knew how it would go um, yeah. with JDT and with company. You absolutely romp the championship. It, it looked easy, I thought, at times last season. I thought you were... Obviously, you won the league in terms of the championship and you went up. I thought you would be the ones with the best chance of staying up. It turned out it was probably Luton because it it looked like he just refused to be pragmatic at all uh, and yeah, almost doubled down on some of the things. Um, in terms of coming down and then and then he's gone, I, I always got that gig. He needs to give Pep Guardiola some of the cuts of that money, doesn't he? Um, yeah, but, 100%. When you've then brought Scott Parker in, I mean, he's had a mixed record, but I kind of got it because I thought, well, 
he plays a similar style of football. So actually, I think this will, there'll be a little bit of pain in terms of some players. Sander Berg, for example, wanted to leave Sheffield United. He's going to want to leave. He wants to play Premier League yeah. football. No, it's nothing about the clubs he's at. He wants to leave. I thought there'd be a little bit of that, but not as much as there has been. Um, yeah. I thought that there would be almost a little bit of pain early on, but then with Parker playing similar style of football, it wouldn't be a massive transition. And the fact that the upheaval's going on, I mean, it looks like some of these players came because of company and have then left because of him. There's Fulham fans, you see bits and bobs and, and piping up saying, well, this is what Parker does. He upsets people. Obviously, we've seen yeah. a couple of clips of, of Brownhill not looking too happy and Parker. So I think you were always going to have this a little bit, but I can't believe the extent of what's going on. And, and the fact that Parker walked away from, was it uh, was it Wolves he walked away? No, it Bournemouth, was, uh, weren't Bournemouth it? wasn't it? About a game into the season, you think, is he going to do the same? Um, yeah. Uh, so it, it looks like it's absolute carnage going on. I think it's probably that, that absolute microscope of, of the time that we're recording this because it all seems yeah. to happen from Thursday onwards almost, didn't it? But yeah, yeah. I mean, our hope as an outsider, a big outsider looking in, is that you don't get much of it done before Friday and you can't register any of them. And and that also there's it's still up in the air of who's going out. So how are you planning for the game on Saturday? These are the kind of things that give us a, a chance, I think, on Saturday. But... Um, yeah, I think I think that's the thing that annoys the fans the most. Like we've, you know, the, the transfer window opened what first of July. We've had all this time to do it. If you if you're going to get rid of Sander Burge and you're going to get rid of Wilson Odebert, I know it doesn't always work like this because people come in yeah. the bids, but to do it so scattergun and just completely sell off the squad the week before the derby, and then that culminates in us putting three goalkeepers on the bench again. Sorry, two goalkeepers on the bench against Sunderland and three under 21s on the bench, having no quality on the bench other than Zeki Amdune, who apparently is also off as well. It just it, it, it the way that they've done it, if it culminates in not bringing enough quality in and then like losing 2 0 against you at the turf. They were complaining yeah. last year. I don't know if you've bothered watching the documentary. To be honest, I thought if there were one on Blackburn, I'd, I wouldn't watch it. But they were complaining last year in the documentary about how poor the atmosphere is. The atmosphere was poor because we'd all go there buzzing, excited for a match, and then within you know 10 minutes, we'd be 2 0 down. We're 2 0 down against City within six minutes or whatever it was, 2 0 down against Villa within 12. So that's why the atmosphere was so bad. If they want to see an atmosphere, it's going to be a toxic yeah. one if all of this ends up culminating in you guys being given the chance to beat us for the first time in 14 years or whatever it is. So they've got a big yeah. week ahead of them. I yeah. am holding on for some hope, but it's yeah, it's a big week for us, really is. I haven't watched the second one, if I'm being honest. I've heard the ending's pretty decent, but... Um, no, the ending when Parker comes in, so fingers crossed that's the start. Oh, right. no, we get relegated, oh. I think, in the, f the first bit of it. The first bit oh, of the last I'll, episode, sorry. I'll watch that bit. Um, but yeah, no, <laughs> I did watch the first one. And the thing that struck me was, I mean, Rovers are by no means a model club anymore. They used to be, but they're not. But you look at the teams like Brentford that, that, that have gone up. What they always did really well was Ollie Watkins was going to be sold. They had a peak value for him and they had a list of replacements. And actually that replacement usually came in six months before and... Yeah, he'd go out and, and job done. Now, I get when you come down from the Premier League, that's not going to happen. But what struck me from watching that documentary, to be fair, the first one was how much control company had and how much seemed to rest on him. And it was like everybody looked at him like this god in that room. And I just thought, mm -hmm. if he goes, surely it can, it's just looking like this on, on, on the way it's been recorded. But if he goes, who's bringing in the transfers? And it almost looks like that is actually how it's been, that he's gone and then the, he's taken the list of transfers with him. And you think, surely when you come down from the Premier League, you've got an idea Sander Berg's going to go. So, right, well, we'll sell these players and if we, they, they want to go, absolutely fine. Don't want to play for us, get out the door. I get that idea. But you'd have a list of replacements that you just go right, bang, 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 surely. Um, and it looks like it's almost come as a surprise to everyone and that you're now yeah. reacting to it, which is... It's poor, isn't it, really? You know, I mean, that's been us for a while, but that's poor if you're reacting to things this late in a window because there's always a chance people like Sander Berg are going to go out the door. Yeah, and obviously it's ended up being a lot more than that as well. If it were just Sander and maybe Dara and maybe Wilson Orderbear, we'd get it. You know, we've got 30 million for Wilson Orderbear. I think it was 20, 25 yeah. million for Sander. If you know, if we sell it, we've got 10 million for company. You know, if we're selling these sort of players, like we get it, that's fine. We need 
some of these players need to be offloaded. We also need to close the gap in terms of the broadcasting revenue from the Premier League to the Championship. The wages have all come down anyway because they've all got clauses in the contract. So I think that's another reason why so many players are wanting out, maybe, just playing yeah. devil's advocate. Um, but again, you've still got to bridge the gap with the wage bill. The wage bill has to come down. So we get it. As fans, we completely understand. But so many in the last couple of weeks of the window is just, it's not making the board look good. And I'm the kind of fan that's trying to back them over the last few weeks and it all culminated in that Sunderland game where I was starting to get frustrated and I started getting pelters on Twitter. People saying, oh, I remember when you told everybody to be calm. I was like, well, yes. Now new information <laughs> has come to light and we've got two goalkeepers on the bench. Things have changed, my friend. Um, so, yeah, interesting. Big week at Burnley, which obviously culminates in that. If we don't Imagine if we, if we do not bring anyone in and then you beat us, I, I, I honestly fear for the board. Uh, but just going back as well, I know you mentioned Parker a little bit and how he gets frustrated and stuff. And there are, I know it weren't you that mentioned it, but you did allude to Fulham and Bournemouth fans saying, oh, this is what Parker does. Mm. It's not Parker that's doing it. It's the board. He's just, they're just yeah. selling everybody from underneath him. Um, so a big week. Uh, hopefully it all comes to light and Alan does come and talk to us. Uh, not on the podcast. I mean, that would be fantastic, Alan, um, <laughs> if you're watching. Um, but he does come and talk to the fans and tell us what's going on when the window shuts. Hopefully the window shuts Friday night. Everybody, everybody's registered by Thursday. We go out, a nice, easy game on Saturday. I'm sure you'll disagree with that bit. But then a nice public, everyone's happy and a nice, happy statement on Monday. Um, I do normally wrap it up around half an hour, but obviously with it being the big game for, for us both, um, I do want to quickly get, and this might be a section that some Burnley fans don't want to listen to. I know I'm not going to enjoy hearing this. <laughs> um, but give me your favourite memories of the Derby. I, I, I know you're going to have to go back a long way, uh, but give me your favourite memories of the derby, please, mate. And um, yeah, it's probably going to be the yeah. five nil in it or the done offside. Well, I mean, genuinely now, growing up, I mean, I, I've got a group of a core group of probably four mates that I went to nursery with, primary school. One of them's a Burnley fan, and as we grew up, yeah, we'd wind him up, but you were an irrelevance. It was like, yeah, Burnley, but we never played you. I, we didn't play yeah. you until I was fifteen. Um, so I mean, I think we did in like the Lancashire Cup and things when I was really, really young, but that was obviously what it is. Um, so we played you obviously away at Turf Moor and won 2 0 quite comfortably, uh, in, in an absolute battle that a game that I don't think will be allowed. That's anymore, the one that but, yeah. Kevin Ball got sent off in, isn't it? I remember that one, yeah. I was, I was there, <laughs> just so you, you yeah. <laughs> when you've got people you like. Me, well, yeah, you would you would think that way. <laughs> but when when you've got people like Damien Duff absolutely losing his rag and two footing people, you know something's not quite right. Yeah. Uh, and soon soon Essen turn it trying to calm it down. But yeah, obviously then he came to to Ewood and yeah, it was April Fool's Day, the sun was out, absolutely everything. It was I'll be honest, that championship just doesn't exist anymore, does it? The the gap between the two, it was like a Premier League team and you were almost like a well, it, it you were pretty embarrassing, to be fair. It was it was not the levels were just a joke. Um and it and it was, yeah, obviously it was it was great. It was it was five nil, it was wonderful. And then as time went on, I mean, the fact you brought Brian Laws in amused us all. Um, and then we went on to beat you then. And it was kind of I don't think this lot are ever gonna overtake us. And then mm. lo and behold, we go and change ownership, which had to happen. Um and they get absolutely sold down the river by an agent. And then our world sort of implodes, doesn't it, as Rovers fans? And we kind of are, you, I'm sure you lot will say back where we belong, but then the tables have turned, let's be honest. Um, so it, it was the first time you beat us, I was about, well, I was in my 20s and it yeah. was coming. I was, I, I was 21. Was. I, I was 21. It'd been coming yeah. for a while. Like, there'd, there'd been like three yeah. or four one ones. There was a done offside. Yeah which was a fucking disgrace, yeah. may I add. Um, we should have won that day. Honestly, mate, I, I was in the stand. I was in the stand. <laughs> I was in the stand. You went 1-0 up, didn't you? And um, obviously then we equalised through Shackle. Then Ings scored. And that yeah. was the season after, I think, the done offside or... or, or I, th I think it was. I think it was a season after. I might be wrong. Apologies if I'm wrong. But I think it was a season after the done offside. And they added like four or five minutes on. And mate, I, I've never been as nervous in my life in them five minutes. I turned around. Yeah. I was like on the floor like that. I just couldn't watch. And full time whistle. Obviously, not to rub it in. I've shown you. You've felt it. You've experienced it before. It we're fantastic. Um, to finally get that. I, I was like you growing up. I think we're a similar age and probably just a little bit younger. Um, but I was like you growing up, watching you guys just being miles ahead of us. And I remember yeah. thinking, like, are we ever going to beat them? And then we'll draw in 1-1 and you were chanting that you'll never sing the Rovers. And I just remember thinking like, they're actually right. I don't think we're ever going to beat them. So to finally do it, I had to wait until yeah. 21 years old. But I am now 36. 
and it's you've not beaten us since. So I probably would have took that growing up. If somebody yeah. said, yeah, you're not going to see him win against these till you're 21. Uh, but then after that, you'll have 14, 15 years of superiority, or whatever the word is, over him. <laughs> um, then I'd have took it. But yeah, it's obviously my favourite. You know what? My favourite memory isn't last year winning, not last year, the year before winning the league at your gaff. It's not even the the Turf Moor one, which, you know, you barely even touched the ball. They were brilliant. Getting, I felt like that one was how you would have felt in the 5-0. The thing that yeah. annoyed me the most about that 3-0 is we didn't put you to the sword even more, but that's what we used to do so much over under company is we'd get 3-0 mm. up and then just stop. And I remember yeah. thinking, come on, I, I want to do to them what they did to us. And we yeah. didn't, thankfully, for your case. It, but I think I, th I think my favourite memory is is that first win, that Danny Ings one, I think. I don't think it's last year. That's probably a controversial <laughs> opinion, sorry, not the year before. When we finally beat you and all the emotion came came out, which is probably what it'll feel like for, for, for some of the younger Rovers fans this weekend, if that yeah, happens. Yeah. But that's that's mm -hmm. probably my favourite memory of the derby, if I'm honest. Yeah, I, I mean, my nephew's 18. He doesn't really remember, you know, he do, doesn't remember Martin Olsen chucking himself on the floor. I'll tell you what, I watched that. Has anyone seen? Just go on YouTube and watch Martin Olsen's dive at, at Turf Moor. It's, that, honestly, I, I, this is what I mean. There were so many injustices. Remember. It's horrendous. He's nowhere near Dunn, him. No Dunn, was near off, him. <laughs> Dunn was offside. Well, we knew he wasn't anywhere near him from the other end of the ground. So the fact that yeah. um, he gave it, Dunn was obviously miles offside and about six minutes added on. It was just, it was all just, it, it was amusing as a Rovers fan, obviously. Not so amusing, but then, yeah, it, it was coming. But then, you're right, last time we played you at Turf Moor, I'll be honest, there's not many times as a Rovers fan that you are pretty embarrassed. Um, and I was watching it, and I was, you just sort of almost sat on the, on the top of your seat, and you're just thinking, what the hell is going on? But that was mm. the problem with JDT. That was JDT summed up, that there was times when it was just inevitable what's happening, and he just never changed it. I mean, the team he played that day, by the way, was an absolute disgrace. He left out Scott Wharton, a Blackburn lad. He left out Adam Wharton. He played Clinton Mola for his first league game, who played in the Cup against West Ham the week and had half decent games. So I played him and he was one of the worst players I've ever seen in a Rover shirt. He played a left winger at right wing back, a right back at left. It just the whole thing was a mess. Um, I think the last game at Ewood was, was more of what we saw under JDT when fans yeah. did like him. But you saw the two sides in those games. That was exactly what we experienced throughout his time there. I don't think in terms of performance-wise, I'd be very shocked if either of them happened. I don't think we'll dominate possession like we did in the second game. And I equally, I would be shocked if we rolled over. I think that's the most unused to slight thing to happen. Um, I think we'll be a team that's that grinds out results under useless at times and a team that can dominate possession. And I think, you know, against a team that, I would imagine you'll have a lot of the ball. It, he'll expect that and, and he'll adapt accordingly. Whereas JDT would have just gone into it the same as it way he would have ad um, approached Derby. He really would. Yeah, it's interesting. I, uh, like I said, I do normally wrap it up around half an hour, but I just want to ask you a couple more questions. Um, yeah, yeah. How, how are you expecting to play then? I think you've said already you'll let us have the ball. The part of me that is getting me a little bit of confidence for it is hoping that you, not as fans, but your team, is getting a little bit giddy with the start that you had, thinking, oh, we can take the game to Burnley. We might be able to take the game mm. to them. If you try and take the game to us, I do think we'll pick you off. But if you sit in and just say, nope, we're going to try and yeah. maybe counter you or, 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 or just let you have the ball, then we might struggle to break you down, depending on who's playing. If we still have Amduna, which I don't think we will, we might be able to unlock you. If we still have Coley Orshaw, which I think we will, this is going out after and he's probably sold, though, in my look, then we might have the quality to be able to break you down. But how, how are you expecting sort of like set up against us in terms of style of play? I don't think we'll sit in like we did against Leeds because he's had more time to work with the players now. And he's playing at the moment, we're playing a 4-2-3-1 and we're playing almost man for man at the top end of the pitch at times. Yeah. Um, the problem we've got is the likes of Gay is quite important to that. After half an hour, he's, he's absolutely knackered at the minute um, because he's, he's not had a pre-season. So... We, we won't be like JDT where we're expansive. There'll be a halfway house, but I expect what will happen is the, we'll set off, not pressing you ridiculously, but we press quite high at the moment. And if you start to pick around that, I think they will yeah. sit a bit more into a shape, which I expect to happen. Um, I don't think we'll be on, we'll try not to be on the edge of our box anyway, but it, I expect you to have a lot of the ball. We'll probably be quite happy after that for you to have it around the back. You come into the midfield and into our halfway, we'll get tight. Um, 
But the one problem that we've got is we don't have a, not just because of his goals, the Smodics, we don't have anybody who can run in behind at the moment. Mm-hmm. Gay can do it a little bit, but there's nobody with that threat. So if you did sit in, it, we would get penned in a bit. So we don't do that, thankfully. I think my fear against um, opposition teams at the moment comes between the centre halves and the full backs. So our full backs are pretty decent, our centre halves are pretty decent, but there is a gap between them quite often. And the way that you guys tended to play, I mean, at the moment, we don't know how you're going to play, do we? But the way with your sort of inside forwards, if you like, um, you know, when you had Zorori, for example, running in that channel between the right back and the centre half, that would have been where I think you would have had a lot of success. Um, yeah. I would imagine, you know, we've got Sondre Tronstad in midfield, very underrated, just strolls around the pitch, patrolling that area, picking off any number 10s, picking off anyone who's making those balls. And, and so if you've got players running in, he did it against Norwich. Their, the way they tried to play was their fullbacks tried to become the player who runs behind, between the right back and the centre half. He just follows them. Very important yeah. to us. Um, and then Travis kind of goes and does what Travis does. He's almost a budget Robbie Savage, goes and harasses and tries to wind everyone up. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think there'll be any surprises how we play. I, I think you'll end up having a lot of the ball and set pieces will be quite important to us. You know, we've got some big lads now. Equally, we're still not brilliant at defending them. So if you're half decent at them, I would expect that that could cause us some issues. We've got a goalkeeper who most of the fans, unfortunately, just don't have any faith in, which gives probably him nerves because the moment the ball goes back to him, they panic. Yeah, We look, as time of recording, we're going to bring one in, but they're not going to start at weekend, are they? So uh, it looks like it's going to be Mark Travers from Bournemouth. Yeah, well, we were linked to him, but then obviously now that's cooled and he's, he's linked with you, so that's interesting. I didn't yeah. see that. I don't think he's a, he's a decent keeper. The championship, yeah, league, I think, he's an okay keeper. I think, it seems the plan is to bring him in on loan with it at the end of the year, then purchase him, which would tie in with our, the India government. Still, restrictions are still in place a little bit. Um, so, yeah, I, I think the pattern of the play will be that we don't necessarily intend this. We'll try and press you quite high without going gung ho, but you'll probably end up with a lot of the ball. Um, and we will then play for Inter Gay. I imagine he will start and then try and play off there. Interesting. It's always interesting to find out how teams are going to play. You mentioned there that Zorori could have had some success, obviously, another one that we've sold. Um, but I don't think he'd have played too much. But then, like I said, it's just we've lost depth and everything now. Um, but if Corley Osho is still here, it sounds like he could hmm. do something similar on the opposite wing because um, he's good at going yeah. inside and, and, and hopefully exploiting that gap. So we'll see. But we just don't know who's going to play uh, for Burnley. We don't know who's going to be here. I would like to think that Alan and ALK have done selling now. They've had enough sales. Um, who knows? We could end up without Vegost up front. I would very much doubt it. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. Big week. Don't know who's going to play, so I can't really tell you how we're going to play. Um, but I would suspect we'll try and do to you. If you are going to press us, we'll try and do to you what what we did to Luton. We let Luton come and press us and, and press it higher up and then bang ball through the back and and one on one, one nil. Then did the same for two nil, really. Um, and we did that against Cardiff a couple of times as well. Um, but against Sunderland, mate, we were pretty poor. But yeah, the squad was pretty depleted. Um, let's wrap it up then, mate. But obviously before I do, score predictions, please. I don't really want to predict this. And for me, perfectly honest, this is one I don't want to predict. Um, I can't predict you to win, can I? I'll go 2-2. Two, 2-2? Two. Two, two. I mean, what? I said 2-2. Two, two. I would take 2-2 two, two all day long. All day long, I would take it. I, I kind of... You know what? I, I don't want you to even score. Obviously, I don't want you to score against us, but I do like the fact that you haven't mm. even scored against us for like 11 years now. That's like another little thing that must be sort of like annoying some fans. And you'll have Blackburn fans who are 14 that won't remember ever seeing them score again. Like, it's the, like you said, <laughs> the exact opposite of what I was growing up with has now flipped. Yeah, yeah. All right, we've not been as dominant and not done as much as what you did when I was younger uh, in terms of actual success. Um, but it's good to see the actual, <laughs> the derby flip the other way around. 2-2, um, I wouldn't tech. I'd tech. I, I don't. Th- I said earlier, I'd take a draw, and I kind of stand by it in the sense that I am worried. I've got this anxious over the derby for the first time in about like, ten years or whatever. But I do still think ultimately we have the better players, we have the better squad. I just don't know who who the squad's going to be. If Corley Orshaw's in no. the side, Josh Cullen's in the DM role. We really missed him on Sunday. Uh, sorry, on Saturday against Sunderland. Um, and obviously, Warrell's in the defensive role. Having said that, C- CJ Gamelli actually did quite well. But I would obviously rather have Worrell in there. And then a couple of additions as well, hopefully. Uh, we should we should 
be able to to, to put you to the sword. So I'm going to say 2-0 to Burnley. I don't think it'll be anywhere near as easy as what it was at the turf last year. I would love it if it was. You know what? It's weird because obviously we've just beaten Cardiff 5-0. At the start of the season, I predicted you two to be a very similar place in the league table. I think you're very similar clubs in terms of quality on the pitch, or so I did before the start of the season. Um, they've obviously looked pretty poor, whereas you haven't. But we beat them 5-0 and it looked a lot. I don't know, if, obviously, if you've spoken to your, your friend who's a Burnley fan, 5-0 looks like it was so comfortable and ridiculously easy. It wasn't. They were probably the better side for 60 minutes. But we just had the quality to punish them. And I'm hoping that it's a similar vibe. Like, yes, it'll be a little bit cagey. The first half, by the way, like we've, we've spoken about the first game at the turf from a couple of years ago, the 3-0. The first half in that was incredibly cagey. And I remember you had a chance early on in the second through Diaz. Not a great chance, but I remember go, when he was going from a goal thinking, here it is, bloody hell, it's going to happen. And obviously we ended up yeah. winning quite comfortably. Um, I'm hoping it's a similar game to, to that, the first half, but then we just have the quality to be able to put you to the sword. Um, Fingers crossed anyway. Obviously, I'm sure you'll disagree. But, Mark, thank you for coming on, mate. It's been a pleasure. I know not many people will <laughs> go and check out your content, but I always like to ask people to get, sort of like plug their own channel, let our fans know where they can where they can go and watch yeah. your stuff. And, and and I say people won't go and watch it. If we win on uh, Saturday, and they say Sunday then, I'm sure a few Burnley fans might migrate over to watch a couple of videos. And I'm sure you guys will do the same. So where can people find you, mate? Uh, it's at the Blackburn End pod. Uh, yeah, so um, we usually do a match reaction. Um, the guy, Mike, usually does the match reactions. Uh, he lives a bit further away. He doesn't get to as many games. So if they're on Sky and stuff, he usually does the, the match reactions. Um, he can't do it this weekend. So before anybody says, why is there not one out there? Um, I'll be honest, that then falls on me. And if I have to get a bus back to Ewell Park and then drive home... And uh, I feel like I did after the last time I did that from Turf Moor. I probably won't be doing a match reaction. Uh, if we do win or we get a draw, I'll probably do it live outside the ground. So, yeah, that's pretty much yeah. the way it will go. Uh, but, yeah, it's... Um, to be honest, I think... I, I suppose I would say this, but we, we like to try and be as impartial as possible. We try like to try and see both sides of the coin. We're not people who just stand on there and go, oh, we're going to beat Burnley 5 0 and this, that. It, that's not what we do in ours. But yeah, if you want to want to go and have a look, feel free. Um, I'm sure they probably won't, unless they want to pop into the comments if you beat us. But yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm, we do live shows on Sundays, normally around 6 30 pm. And I'm a little bit worried this weekend because it's just going to be full of, if you beat us, it's just going to be, I'm just going to be spending my time blocking everybody and I can't really be bothered yeah, with yeah. it. Um, so it's yeah. going to be it's going to be hard work for one of us, mate. But I did the same as you when we won when we won at e, not at Ewood when we won at the turf last time. I did I do a sixty second review after every match. I did my sixty second review at the turf, still in my seat about you know five minutes after full time because I stayed on to soak it all in. And then at Ewood, I, on the, I did it on the drive back and all lads at car just started chanting champion. Is it were it were fun? Um, but yeah, I'm sure people will be checking it out depending on the result, mate. But this is a bit where I usually say thank you for coming on. And I will say thank you for coming on. But I also say good luck for the season, mate. But I'm, unfortunately, I can't really extend that um, to you. Um, but yeah. good luck with the podcast, mate. I normally say good luck for the season, but after the weekend. Um, but yeah. just in terms of football, mate, no good luck at all to you, no. please. Uh, good luck with the podcast. Fair enough. I hope you built it up. <laughs> well, I'm sure you'll say it same to me. I hope you build it up, yeah. mate, and I hope you enjoy doing it. I know you, you sound like you're relatively new to it, like doing it, you know, um, the Black and Pod side of it. Um, so genuinely yeah. all the best with that one, and I'm sure our paths will cross. Definitely for the away game, like I said, I feel like you have now been promoted into the only Blackman fan I'll allow on the channel role uh, that Dan has vacated. So well done. Uh, I'll send you the um, I'll send you the details later in the year, and I'm sure we'll see each other yeah. at some events as well in the coming future if you keep sort of like building it up. So mate, genuinely appreciate it. I know it's yeah. not easy coming on no um, that Burnley podcast, so I do appreciate it, mate. No worries, bud. And yeah, similar to be fair, good luck with the channel. Absolutely not good luck with the season. I want you to fully implode. I'm not going to lie, but um, and I'd like a front row seat of it a weekend, but I don't think it will. Fingers crossed, mate. Fingers crossed. Cheers.